Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with this, the Brahms Symphonies, conducted by Adam Fisher with the Danish Chamber Orchestra on Naxos. Now, I loathe these performances. I truly do. That doesn't mean they aren't good of their type. There are two ways that I can approach a recording like this. I can get my cat, I can get my scarf, I can jump up and down and go crazy, or I can adopt a more measured and logical and serious approach. And frankly, I think Adam Fisher deserves it because he's a serious artist. He's done a wonderful Mozart cycle, Mozart symphony cycle with these people, some terrific Mozart operas, all in Denmark. He did the complete Haydn symphonies, some of which were marvelous. He's done a Beethoven cycle with these people, which some of you liked more than I did. Uh, we used an example from it. So, you know, the, the guy deserves to be taken seriously. And and I, I intend to do that, despite the fact that I really dislike these performances. Why? Well, because he's doing them with a teeny tiny little orchestra, and it's inappropriate. It's disrespectful. <laughs> it's not about Brahms. It's about this guy. It's another example of how, in this day and age, in order to justify doing the same thing over and over and over again, endlessly, you got to have a concept. And that concept may be congruent with the composer's ideas of what the music should sound like, or it may not be. And this is a big not be. And I intend to demonstrate that very clearly. The only excuse, let's be very simple, for doing Brahms with a teeny tiny chamber ensemble is the silly authenticity excuse. The idea that, well, Brahms actually had to work with some very small orchestras in his lifetime. And that is true. That falls under the Tovey dictum, which is that scholarship is not obliged to insist on the restoration of conditions that ought never to have existed. Because the reality is, and this has been demonstrated, I'm going to demonstrate it for you right here in this very spot, so get ready, that Brahms preferred larger orchestras. He wanted them whenever he could get them. He wrote for them. He liked the mining and orchestra. There's no question about it. That was the tiny orchestra he dealt with. And the mining and court orchestra was one of the greatest orchestras in Europe. It was a chamber orchestra. And the reason he liked it is because he could go there and work with them and try things out and work them out and and adjust things and you know in on the way toward you know finalizing his conception of the work but once that was done he he went back to his big orchestras well, let me explain to you what's happening because because the danish chamber orchestra has i don't know i tried to count maybe 40 45 people something around there um, the, there's not a, a orchestration list of personnel in here, so I can't really say. But there's a picture. And in the picture, if you look at the picture, I'll show you the picture. I mean, I'm not going to hold it while you count, but but there is a very nice picture of the Danish Chamber Orchestra on, on you know, the staircase photo. There they are. That's the ensemble. Now, that doesn't mean that's necessarily the ensemble used in these recordings, but I suspect it was, or it's close to it. The Mining and Court Orchestra, which was the smallest orchestra that we know Brahms had a regular relationship to, had about 48 players. And the entire situation with Mining and is discussed in a marvelous essay by the Brahms scholar Styra Avens called The Excellent People of the Mining and Court Orchestra. This is about a visit that Brahms paid to Mining in in about 1884 for the purpose of trying out and adjusting his third symphony while he was on the premier tour of the symphony, because this is what happened. You know, Brahms would write a symphony, he'd have it in manuscript, and then he'd go all over Germany or wherever and perform it with different places to try it out and see how it sounded. And then he'd make corrections and diddle it. And then once everything was corrected and correct, he would send it to his publisher to be published. And this was the orchestra, one of the orchestras he really liked to use because he had essentially unlimited rehearsal time. You know, Duke, Georg II, or whichever one he was, of, of 
of, of Saxa mining and whatever his little duchy was, um, had the money and the desire to let Brahms come and work with an orchestra, which is an invaluable thing in the days before recordings. That does not mean this is the ensemble that Brahms would have preferred to hear his music. And let us let us make some of these ideas clear with reference to to uh, Styra Evans's article. So here she goes. Who were the members of the orchestra and what did it sound like when Brahms arrived in early 1884? She writes, the orchestra had approximately 48 players. That number could be enlarged from local military bands when necessary, and they could get supernumeraries and whatnot. But the string section was particularly limited. In fact, she told me when I spoke to her today about this, that they did enlarge the orchestra when Brahms was there. So, I mean, there's a letter saying that where the Duke says to Brahms, come on and come during this period because I can afford to have more players. Um, at that time. And the mining orchestra also formed the core of the Bayreuth Orchestra, which is also extremely interesting. But here we go. Um, she said, in contrast, Wiesbaden had enlarged its orchestra to 60 players for the first performance of Brahms' Third Symphony. Vienna regularly used 80 players, 68 of them strings. The Frankfurt Museum Orchestra had a regular roster of 70 players. Um, after 1880, and Berlin had 80 members, and by the end of the 1880s, under von Bülow, who was also the conductor in Meiningen, in Meiningen, Hamburg's orchestra also boasted 80 players. So those were the orchestras that Brahms, you know, expected when he was performing his symphonies, when he had the opportunity, most of the time. So there you go. Now, there's more to it than that, though some very interesting additional things because first of all then the issue becomes well what did the orchestra sound like did they sound anything like the danish chamber players sound and that's where things really get interesting we're talking about the quality principally of string playing the kind of sound they made the use of vibrato and all of that stuff and if bulo's opinion of the mining and players when he got there around 1880 and German string playing in general is very interesting and we know what it is because he wrote it down he said she she writes Bulo was not satisfied with what he found in mining and his goal was to have a string section rich in sound which in his judgment was lacking he wrote to Hermann Wolf complaining about he had to, he had had to work to get the sound he wanted in a recent concert. He writes, the strings were so let me see were so prosaic, dry, and also technically undeveloped. In general, German violinists are a misery. Warmth, taste is only to be found in the Belgian and French school. All in all, I wouldn't give two cents for the so-called German element element in reproductive musical arts. So that's that's pretty harsh, um, Bulo's opinion of the mining and string players. And so he replaced them eventually with players who were more to his liking. And Avens goes on. Nevertheless, if von Bulo was seeking the sound present in the Belgian and French school, he was looking for the sound of vibrato. The later history of the orchestra under Fritz Steinbach bears this out, as we shall see. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, just so you get the idea um, of what's going on. What was the norm in the mining court orchestra regarding vibrato? Regarding the players, one can speculate, as the more prominent players studied and performs with arti performed with artists for whom vibrato is known to have been a normal part of their equipment. Mulfeld, who was the clarinetist, who Brahms wrote all of his late clarinet works for, Mulfeld himself has been widely reported to have developed a clarinet vibrato, perhaps the consequence of having started his career as a violinist. But the issue of vibrato in Meiningen, in Meiningen is definitively settled by Walter Blume's publication of Steinbach's conducting notes for the four Brahms symphonies. Now, Steinbach was one of the successors of von Bülow at Meiningen, and he wrote down 
all of his, uh, or Bluma, who was an associate of his, transcribed his performance notes. And in these performance notes, I'm just going to summarize it very quickly because we don't need to go crazy about it. There are only two moments where he specifically says, in this passage, use no vibrato, and in that passage, use no vibrato. A couple of bars of the first symphony and a couple of bars in the third, meaning that at all other times, there would have been some level of vibrato. I mean, if you have to tell people not to do something, it means they're doing something. And so the evidence we have of Steinbach and the mining in orchestra is that they did indeed use vibrato. And of course, there are performances that are based, let me see if I can find it. Yes, here we are, on that specific prescription. Here it is. It's the Charles McCarris Brahms cycle with the Scottish National Orchestra, which is based on the prescriptions in the Meiningen typescript of Steinbach's Brahms performance instructions. And there's plenty of vibrato, as much as you could possibly ask for. But that, more to the point, more to the point, and this is the real issue, the idea of playing today it's a mistake. It's wrong of Fisher. And this is what annoys me about him because he is a serious musician, but he's not a smart one. He's not a scholar. It's, it's a joke what these people do most of the time, Fisher and their ilk. Why? Because the, the, their, their emphasis is just on being different and going with their concept. It's about them. It's narcissistic. It's not about Brahms. It's not about Brahms at all. Modern taste today is for performances that are light, fleet, and sparing of vibrato. For whatever reason, some people like that. I think that vibrato is neither good nor bad. It should be appropriate. It should be appropriate to the repertoire, to what the music is trying to express. Brahms without vibrato, Brahms with a teeny, tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny string section is a complete non sequitur. But more important than that, if you look at what Avens writes and what the scholarship, the real scholarship, the scholarship based on documentary evidence and eyewitness testimony, not, you know, the occasional theoretical treatise or, or you know, other foolishness or instrument construction or all kinds of bullshit. I mean, the real deal tells us that the emphasis, Bulo's emphasis, which was perfectly clearly stated was to make a chamber orchestra have a bigger sound. The idea was to hire more players if you could, and if you couldn't, get the best string players who had the richest, warmest, most human, singable, lyrical, gorgeous sound you could get, so that the impression that that ensemble made was of an ensemble much larger than what it actually was. Here, the intent is just the opposite. That argument is, is history. It's been won. The tradition has been to make that big, beautiful sound that we know Brahms wanted. But here, it's just the opposite. It's to take the big, beautiful sound, which today's well-trained violinists have by nature and by training, and reduce it and eliminate it. So instead of having a chamber orchestra trying to sound like a larger orchestra and playing its heart out with that in mind, you have a chamber orchestra that diminishes its sound, that diminishes the music, that is constantly trying to do little, little tiny dynamic gradations and, and, and trickeries of balance and finesse in order to minimize the sound and pursue textural transparency at all costs. And that is contrary to not only what Brahms wrote, plainly what Brahms wrote, what the music demands, but it's contrary to what we know about how performers at the time in his lifetime actually played and what his stated preferences were. And that is why I don't like this. I just don't. But I, it, this is not up to me. When it comes to recordings, of course, what matters is whether you like it. It's not about my opinion. I'm just stating the facts. The fact is, this is more about Adam Fisher doing his thing on Brahms than it is about Brahms's music being realized through the medium of Adam Fisher and the Danish Chamber Orchestra. And I'm going to play you a couple samples, and then you can make up your own mind. 
I mean, because Naxos, unlike the other ridiculous labels that give me hell, if I dare to use an example of something, um, you, you know, will let me play these samples. And that means that whether I like something or not, you're going to be the one to decide. And isn't that better? It's, I think that's wonderful. You would think that rather than let me sit up and jump up and down and trash something, they would let me play some samples of it. I could say what I think is wrong. I could say what I think is right. And you would make up your mind. And it would be far more interesting and I think fair for everybody. I really do. Rather than you just having to take my word for it, even though I'd be delighted when you do. And I know I'm always right, but that's another issue. So let us listen to a couple samples. First from the Third Symphony. They're both from the Third Symphony. First, the third movement. That lovely, lovely Poco Allegro or Allegretto or whatever the thing it is with a gorgeous cello theme. And listen to this, what I consider to be a completely cool and passionless performance of that movement. Here it is. Is that expressive? I mean, I find I find it to be completely, totally cold and uninteresting. And then we get to the finale, that turbulent, fabulous, angry, wonderful, wonderful, you know, for the Allegro part of it. Then, of course, there's that beautiful autumnal slow coda. So let's listen to once the Allegro gets going and listen to how inadequate, I think, the sound of the violins are. Well, the sound of the violins is, the sound is, yes, the sound of the violins is when placed against the rest of the orchestra, particularly the second subject. Again, in the cellos, you know, do, 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 da, 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 you know, that one. And then the, 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 those jagged two note string interjections that have to sound vicious, they're whiplashes. Here they sound like, well, you can judge for yourself. I'll tell you on the other side. Here you go. It's not helped by the fact that Fisher likes to do sudden diminuendo crescendo things, which are, of course, unwritten. And it's perfectly fine. Conductors do that all the time. They manipulate dynamics and they play around with it. And those diminuendos, they just suck whatever energy the music has right out of it. And those, those two-note violins, they da 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 you know, that business. I mean, they sound like the frogs in Israel and Egypt. You know, the aria, the frog aria, a little froggy things. It's, it's not 
big or angry or volcanic and the strings and the brass and the winds, they don't balance. You know, they, they talk about how these chamber orchestra performances have, you know, wonderful transparency and they do. They do in, in quiet passages, soft passages, but in tooties when they're playing together, when ma masses, orchestral masses, are opposed to each other, you continually have to cut down the brass because they're going to drown out the violins who have the tune. When the woodwinds and all that stuff, it just, it's, it's just not my idea of what Brahms should sound like. Perhaps it's yours. But I can tell you that the scholarship that justifies doing these things this way with a chamber orchestra is complete nonsense. It is contrary to what Brahms preferred. It is contrary to what Brahms wrote and intended. And more than that, it is completely the opposite of what performers in Brahms' own day were attempting to achieve when they were stuck with smaller forces. And that, my friends, is the picture. So keep on listening. Thank you for joining me. Take care.